welcome to AUP's webinar, The UCP's Amazing Race to the Bottom, How the UCP is Rigging the Game and How You Can Fight Back to Win a Better Alberta. Our learning objectives for this webinar are as follows. By the end of this webinar, we hope you will be able to describe how um, specific UCP actions harm public services, unions and workers, identify who benefits from different laws and legislation the UCP are bringing forward and why the UCP is going down the path that is chosen. And you should be able to talk to your coworkers about why you need to fight back together in your workplace. My name is Jordan Thompson and I work in AUP's education department and I'm going to be your host for this webinar. I'm going to now introduce our guest speakers. We have two guests and I also have on this call one of my colleagues, Ferris, who I'll introduce in a few moments after our guests. Some of you know our first guest. He is the beer guy. At least that's he's how he's known on CBC radio in Edmonton where he does a regular beer column. But that's just a side gig. He's known in Alberta's labor movement. Uh, he knows it inside and out because he worked at the Alberta Federation of Labor for 10 years or more than a decade actually. And now he's re researching important social justice issues like occupational health and safety, labor policy, migrant worker protections and union renewal. He does this as the Associate Professor of Human Resources and Labor Relations at Athabasca University. He's written a book called Defying Expectations, the case of UFCW Local 401. And he co-authored an excellent book that I frequently use here at AUPE called Health and Safety in Canadian Workplaces. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Jason Foster. Hello, hello, glad to be here. Let me introduce our second guest, who's not so much of a guest at all because she's an employee like me of AUPE. She works as a full-time research officer here. She's also a PhD candidate at Carleton University in the Department of Sociology and the Institute of Political Economy. Her research analyzes the criminal code as well as Alberta legislation and even how municipal laws all work together to affect the working conditions of the most marginalized workers in society. In the past, she has worked as a political staff person for the Minister of Justice and for the Minister of Education, and she was a teaching assistant at Carleton. She's no stranger to the labor movement either, having formerly held an executive position in Local 4600 of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE. Her work is found in Atlantis Journal, the Canadian Review of Sociology, and Reflect. Uh, join me now in welcoming Lauren Montgomery. Lauren. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, I'd like us to talk briefly about this webinar title um, and maybe also share a quote with you that comes from Premier Jason Kenney. First of all, a race to the bottom. Uh, what does that mean? I don't quite get it. It sounds a little strange. I know that's kind of a policy jargon. Maybe I'll ask Jason, do you mind kind of filling in everyone what that refers to? What's a race to the bottom? Yeah, it's a fairly straightforward metaphor, right? We talk about, when you think about a race, right? It's people trying to be the fastest, trying to be the best, trying to, you know, to, to get to a destination first, right? So Amazing Race Canada, it's about navigating all these challenges, trying to get to the location first. But what we talk, when we talk about the race to the bottom, it's because governments like the UCP government here in Alberta are racing as fast as they can to get to the bottom, to, low, to make corporate taxes as low as they can, to, to lower regulation as low as they can, to, make, to drive workers' wages and working conditions as low as they can. So they're running as fast as they can to try and get us to the bottom, trying to make us, you know, they, they think it's making us more competitive, but what the, co the consequences and the price gets paid by working people as they try and compete against other governments also going in the same kind of race. You know, Jason Kenney really um, spoke to this idea very clearly recently. On October 20th, it was the United Conservative Party's annual general meeting. Jason Kenney made a speech that's recorded. You can go listen to the 30 minutes. The not recorded part was the question period and it was over Zoom. And during the question period, he answered someone's question. He said the following, I'm gonna quote, we keep saying through COVID that we're all in this together. If we're all in this together, we need to see shared sacrifice across our society. The average private sector family has seen their after-tax income decline by 10% in the last few years, the last five years. That simply has not happened in the government sector. 
which has generally had almost airtight job security and defined benefit pensions. And we cannot allow a huge gap to develop between the private sector taxpayers and those who work in the state sector. Maybe I'll turn it over to Lauren here. Lauren, how would you respond to Premier Jason Kenney in, when he makes these kinds of statements? Yeah, I think the first thing that sticks out to me there, Jordan, is that Jason Kenney is obviously pitting private sector workers and public sector workers against one another. Um, but he's also pitting their families against each other, right? So, I mean, my, my first response would be that the public sector provides vital services that keep Albertans safe and healthy um, in a pandemic, but also outside of pandemic times. And it really doesn't help our economy or um, our healthcare system or our social services to pit workers against one another. I mean, Lauren's perfectly right, but I, I think he's also saying that he doesn't value public sector workers, that he's, he thinks that their work, they're not deserving of the wages that they earn. And that somehow having a defined benefit pension plan is a bad thing, um, that that's not about creating income security for your future. And it's not about part of your contributions to society. I mean, this government has said repeatedly, even just as recently as last week in their economic update, right? They talk about how the public sector doesn't create jobs. They don't create wealth. They take wealth from, from society, right? Like somehow the wages and the taxes that public sector workers pay, the contributions they make in their community, the, 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 serve, the important services that they're providing to Albertans somehow doesn't matter. One thing that jumped out to me about the quote was that it really builds on this idea of there being two separate sectors in society. And I know for speaking conveniently about the private and public sector, they are separate and different, but sometimes there's this false division between the two and it doesn't really get into some of the important nuances that I think are important, which is that the public services that um, many AUP members deliver to Albertans every day are actually the things that enable the private sector to function. So if you attack the public sector in many ways, you're just harming the economy overall. Um, you know, I'd like to state the problem as we see it. Uh, and then we'll get into kind of the first real meaty subject here. Um, the UCP government led by Jason Kenney is basically trying to privatize workers uh, and public services. They're attacking unions and they're attacking workers. Um, it appears to me that this is a party that's really focused on supporting corporations and not helping people. Lauren, can you talk to me about how they're doing this through their acts and through legislation? Um, yeah, I, I think one of the really important aspects of this is that they are doing a lot of this through legislation and, and in the legislature, and that the legal system and those processes are not always accessible or easy to understand or easy to follow. And the UCP in their time have actually made those processes more difficult. Um, and what I think is really important is that those systems have never been um, accessible or easy to follow. The, the legal system was never meant to support um, workers or the everyday person because they're built on these systems of uh, oppression like racism and sexism and colonialism. So we really sort of need to understand that um, the, the system was never really built for us, right? The system was never built for workers and Jason Kenney and the government are using that system that was meant to be built against you in order to further sort of constrain workers and to constrain Albertans and to really put additional burdens onto our healthcare system. Okay, let's dive into that first really big topic here. Um, we've got three main ones we wanna to touch on today. So let's go into this first one about public services being dismantled or sold off. Um, Jason, over to you. Can you share a little bit with everyone on the call today? What has been happening? Lots. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's part of the issue is that they, they're doing so much on so many fronts. Um, it can almost just seem overwhelming. And, but, but more importantly, can, you can lose kind of that all through all the different actions that they're taking, that there is an underlying theme here. There is an underlying strategy that they are engaging in. So if we think about, you know, for example, they've, they've cut funding to public schools, but not private schools. Um, they've increased parental choice in their abilities to take their students and the money that goes with those students into private schools, right? They're now going to start building our schools and our roads through what's called pi private public partnerships, right? Which is basically handing off public infrastructure to private interests. 
Um, they're privatizing our parks, for goodness sakes, right? <laughs> like there's there's so many ways in which they're they're canceling on environmental monitoring and giving um, you know the the oil the oil corporations more control over kind of how they do their business. Um, and of course, they're also moving to privatize healthcare services. They want to privatize surgeries. They want to privatize food and laundry and other kinds of core services in the healthcare system. So. When you only when you start to see them taken together, do you start to realize that there is a goal here? There's a strategy to undermine our public services and move those important services into the private sector, to move them into places where people can make a profit off of things like our schools and our hospitals and our parks. Maybe I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren here. Lauren, can you share some of your thoughts on this topic of the attack on public services? Yeah, I think one thing to sort of acknowledge what I think it's important to discuss is that we sort of were always knew that the UCP would do this, but now we're facing a global pandemic that is taking the lives of people all around the world. And we're seeing devastating impacts here in Alberta. And we know that attacking public services like age, government services, healthcare is, is not only cruel or you know, not good for society and the economy, but it's also, you know, it deepens the wounds that this pandemic has has left on our communities. Um, and it's, you know, like we say, beyond devastating that we've seen conservative governments, you know, from Kenny's friend Doug Ford to Brian Pallister, refuse to stop privatizing public services. Um, and just to see how they treat people as disposable and workers as, as disposable. You know, Lauren, uh, one thing I remember back to was when the UCP was still campaigning Jason Kenney um, signed a guarantee, a public health guarantee, saying we will fully fund a public health system. So I'd like to play the devil's advocate for a minute and just say, you know, the UCP is doing that. What would you, how would you respond? My response would be, uh, it's just simply not true. I mean, uh, I viewed that sort of moment as, you know, like a media opportunity where he signed that and sort of wanting to reassure people, but also to really solidify his base. Um, and we just know through like hard evidence and through the actions that they've taken that that's not true. When we look at things like Bill 30, the Health Statutes Amendment Act that was um, released in, in 2020, uh, this piece opened up the door for uh, the public funding of private health care. Um, so when Jason Kenney and ministers say, well, it's public health care. What they're doing is taking public dollars and putting it towards private corporations and CEOs to provide privatized health care. It's not um, a true public health care system. There is something that happened. The UCP killed the super lab. And that kind of is one puzzle piece that fits into this healthcare picture. Can you tell everyone about that? Yeah, this is, a, this is a perfect example of, of how their commitment, their signed commitment to public health care didn't actually play out. Um, so our lab services, most of our lab services in Alberta are, are performed by private companies contracting to the government, contracting to Alberta Health Services. The previous government, and that, that system is under strain. Um, so the previous government said, this doesn't make any sense. We can do this with less, we can do this um, cheaper, um, and with higher quality by centralizing the services in a government agency. And so the previous uh, Notley government um, moved forward to build what we call the super lab. It was a $600 million lab to be built uh, in Edmonton that was going to consolidate lab services under, under, public, um, under a public agency. So there would be public sector workers um, instead of private sector corporations. One of the first actions of the UCP government was to cancel the construction of that lab. The construction had already begun. They had, they had broken ground to build the lab. They canceled that. And now they're parceling out um, the, the, the lab, the important lab services that we have back out to those private corporations uh, that make a profit off of it. And so as a result, it's less efficient uh, and it's costing us more. And now there's this hole in the ground where there was supposed to be a lab and, and said it's just an empty construction site. So let's take some viewer questions right now. Over to you, Ferris. Uh, so how is it that when the UCP um, challenges us legally, they're heard like immediately, like the, the, the same minute? Uh, and then why is it that when the union tries to challenge um, legislation through the courts, uh, it, it can take years? Well, I think it, it, it harkens back to what Lauren was talking about, right? Is that the court system and the legal system is structured uh, 
um, to, to, to serve the interests of corporations and, and the people who serve corporations. Uh, and so they are built to move quickly when government lawyers sort of say, oh, this is really urgent, we need to make this happen. The courts kind of defer to that. They say, oh, okay, we better deal with this really fast. But if a union or, or even just a regular citizen uh, tries to say the same thing, like, my life is being really profoundly impacted by this, the courts generally say, well, hurry up and wait, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's that the, the, the process is, is just is set up in that way. I've talked to AEP members who that's the case for. I actually met a laundry worker at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. I don't know if she's on this call or remembers me, but I remember her uh, just recently on October 26th. She told me, my husband was laid off and this job is the one that our family relies on. She can't afford to have her job privatized or cut. So it's, it's really alarming um, when the UCP basically uh, goes after and attacks the public sector it's very short-sighted. They don't see the deep damage that's being done to the economy, or perhaps they do. And, and that's actually part of what they're trying to do. And I think that's what we're going to get into our next topic. So we've talked a fair bit so far about how the UCP is selling off public services or dismantling them. And let's switch now to our second big topic. Um, the UCP is attacking unions. Why would they do this? Maybe, Jason, can you start us off by talking about how and, and why they're, they're coming after unions so badly? Yeah, I mean, they've they've already in the short couple of years that they've been here um, introduced, I think it's like eight different bills that make sweeping changes to labor relations, to workers protections, um, and to, to union rights. And, and I, what, when, when I analyze kind of what they've been doing, I sort of see that they're kind of they're, they're kind of attacking unions on two fronts. Um, the first is that they're kind of thumbing their nose um, at free collective bargaining. Um, of that process that has long been established, that got established after World War II, um, where you know employers and workers through their unions they negotiate out independent of, of the government interference um, to come to agreements. They're kind of tossing that to the curb. I mean, they've gone in. AUP you know members might remember that you know last year they went in and through legislation delayed your arbitrations for your um, your your wage reopening. Right? just single-handedly changed your contract, your collective agreement to delay um, that process. Um, they've instituted secret mandates for, your, for public sector employers. So the government says to that employer, you have to meet this target and you're not allowed to tell anyone that that's what the target is. Um, that's a compromise of, of free collective bargaining. Um, they're making it harder for workers to be able to join unions um, just through the certification process. Some of those examples may sound technical, um, you know, process oriented, but I think they, they belie a, a, a deeper uh, antipathy towards unions um, as an attempt to try and sort of say, we don't care about these long established processes of free collective bargaining. They don't matter to us when they're inconvenient to us. And I think that sends a dangerous message when a government says, if something's inconvenient for us, ah, we'll just change it, right? That's a very, that's a very troubling thing to do. About that first thing you were mentioning, um, you know, the process piece, were you talking about when the UCP said, oh, uh, we need to wait until we get the results of the McKinnon report, the Blue Ribbon panel? Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, they, well, they used that as their cover um, to, to delay the process. The collective agreement had said um, that arbitrations had to be completed by a certain date, and they just single-handedly said, oh, we need more time, we need more time. That was their argument, but it's the first government in a very long time in Alberta that just sort of went in and single-handedly changed the collective agreement um, because the timelines in that collective agreement were inconvenient. Um, I think that's the significance. Lauren, what are your thoughts about how the UCP is attacking unions and why they're doing this? Yeah, I mean, we've seen it through, like you sort of made reference to, you know, Bill 1, Bill 2, Bill 9, Bill 32. Uh, but I think something that really stuck out to me with the sort of meddling in those processes is that it, it wasn't just about sort of like putting in a power move. It was about really attacking people's wages, right? Like a lot of our members had agreed to take zeros for two years in a row and they had they had gone and they were, they were you know, going through the proper process. And this was supposed to be a, a negotiation and the government just simply didn't want to do that. But it was about really attacking 
their wages. Um, you know, and these are folks, I think something that gets lost a lot of the time or all the time with the government is that, you know, AUP members are doing really vital services. Like folks are, um, you know, holding people's hands when they go in for surgery or supporting them throughout the pandemic or, um, you know, providing environmental services or laundry work or, um, you know, working in government services, really supporting programs like AISH. You know, the, the folks at AUP are really doing such vital and important work. And the government, you know, really did want to push, you know, their weight around and their power through the legislative processes and in the legal process. But they also really just wanted to attack your wages. And they really wanted to be able to, you know, take that away away from members. Jason, you talked a bit about the process piece and the disregard that the UCP has for collective bargaining in Canada and in Alberta. Can you tell me a bit more about some of the specific details of the attack on unions, about um, hamstringing unions and making them less effective? Uh, bill 32, um, which is a bill, I know we were giving lots of numbers of bills, which I know don't necessarily mean anything um, in real life, but th that particular bill was the one that went straight at um, uh, unions. What they've done is they've, they've, they've done a series of things. So one, for example, is that once it's enacted, uh, unions have to get explicit um, consent from every individual member to be able to spend union dues on advocacy, whatever that means, right? Um, so anything that is beyond sort of grievances and collective, bar and collective uh, bargaining, they have to get permission from every single member, not just a vote, right? That's a very profoundly anti-democratic um, move that actually runs counter to what the Supreme Court has argued in terms of um, workers' rights to associate within unions and trade union dues. Um, they've, in this bill, they're restricting picketing so much as to make it completely ineffective. You're not allowed to even uh, slow someone down in their attempts to cross a picket line. If you want to picket um, you're an employer's a second location of the employer or some other sort of secondary site called secondary picketing in the law, you have to get permission from the Labor Relations Board. That is unheard of. It's an unheard of attack on the freedom of expression. And again, it's meant very much, it's very much been designed to try and undermine unions being able to actually do their job and actually allow and allow their members to exercise their rights. Um, again, they've done more to try and undermine um, being able to join a union. Um, and at the same time, while they were, well, at least we can talk about that in a minute, they're also kind of going after sort of basic protections for non-unionized workers, but we can, we can come back to that. I think the key message is that they, they're punishing unions um, because, and they want to make sure that unions can't do their job because they're afraid of unions when unions do their job. Um, we know, you know, when we look at things like Bill 1, um, that they are using, you know, really big legislation and they're doing it in a way to make people feel uncomfortable and fearful of engaging in forms of dissent or protest. And that, you know, despite the state of, of the public health emergency, the Kennedy government has used time in the legislature to pass what I would consider a non-essential piece of legislation. This isn't about making sure that people have proper health care during the pandemic. It's about making people feel uncomfortable to show that they're angry or upset about what the government is doing, so much so that they may not go out and pick it or they're scared of what that bill could, could do to them. And I think that's really important to sort of highlight is that this government is choosing to use time in the legislature on things like this, rather than on providing you know, a fulsome, comprehensive response to the pandemic. So the system has never really been balanced in favor of workers, so they're not really restoring that balance. It's always been balanced in favor of employers and large corporations. Uh, so go ahead and click on that link and you can read about it later. We're getting close to wanting to move on to the third section or the third topic. Before we do that, let's see if there's any other questions that have come through. Ferris, um, what are you seeing? The question is, last week, Jason Kenny was saying that Alberta has one of the strongest healthcare systems in the world. So why would he want to privatize it and make changes? Has anyone asked him this? We do have a, we have a great healthcare system because of the people who work in the healthcare system. We have so many amazing members who are contributing and really carrying the load for that healthcare system. It is not, we have an amazing healthcare system because of the, the folks who work in it, not because of the steps that this government has taken to support that healthcare system. It is really because of 
how amazing and how supportive these healthcare workers are that we have that amazing uh, system. So I think that's really an important, important thing to acknowledge. Public healthcare that is accessible to all, regardless of their income, and you don't have to use a credit card to access important healthcare services, has long been an irritant um, for corporations and, and, and private industry, right? It's this huge, gigantic piece of our economy and our society that is beyond their reach. Um, they don't get to go and make their profits on my, on my, my surgery, right? Or, or my, my need for, for, for healthcare, or go to see my doctor, right? Um, and it's long bugged them. I mean, this is not, this is a long standing effort by the right, by conservatives uh, and neoliberals in Canada to, under, to try and find a way to undermine that bedrock of Medicare. Um, Ralph Klein tried it three or four times during his tenure. He was beaten back every time by public resistance and public pushback by workers, not just healthcare workers, but all workers sort of saying, wait a second, Medicare is really, really crucial for me as a person and as a family and my family and, and as a human being, I'm not gonna let it get handed over to private corporations. So Jason Kenney is just now engaging in just the latest attempt to try and let private for profit interests wheedle their way uh, into our Medicare system. Um, and it's something he's long believed uh, and him and his ilk. It's not always just about Jason Kenney. I mean, Jason Kenney is the premier so he make, he's a very important decision maker at the moment that if Jason Kenney got hit by a bus tomorrow, somebody would come in and replace him and continue along um, with that, that, that same agenda. This is a long standing agenda uh, of conservatives in this country. Jason, your comments reminded me that some people talk about the medicine line as being the border between Canada and the United States and that those for-profit healthcare corporations, the states, see Canada as kind of like this weird outlier, like, boy, we wish we could get in there and earn some profits from the Canadian medical system as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's important that we don't overstate. There's lots of private for profit interests in our healthcare system, whether that be prescription drugs, whether that be um, home care delivery, whether that be you know, long term care. And lo and behold, all of those areas are the areas where we have significant issues uh, in terms of patient safety and or um, profound difficulties for families, you know, being able to afford medication and the like, right? Um, so we've already, they've already been able to whittle away at the edges and they just want to keep taking a bigger piece of the pie because it makes profits for them, but it makes uh, our situation much worse. And Ferris, uh, another question or comment that's come through before we turn to our third topic. Does the Alberta Labor Relations Board have any power to stop the government from eroding our rights? And if they don't, what can AUPE members and AUPE, uh, the union, uh, do to fight back? The short answer is no, they don't, because they are a creature of the government. Um, they are a quasi-judicial body who's been empowered by provincial legislation to be the arbiter, to be the adjudicator of disputes, um, and, to, and to enforce the Labor uh, Relations Code. If the government changes the code, the government changes the rules under which the game is being played, the Labor Relations Board has no choice um, but to kind of referee the game according to the rules, they don't get to change the rules. Um, the one exception um, is if um, something is deemed to be running counter to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, then they can, they can do a preliminary ruling against something, but that ultimately ends up getting fought in the courts. Um, and that's a long process, it can take many years, it's very expensive. Um, we have won important sort of legal victories uh, using the Charter of Rights. How, how practical that has been for workers in workplaces um, and in communities, I think is a question we could, we could have a conversation about. Um, so that, that's sort of the nature of the problem. And, and maybe I'll leave it to, to Lauren or, or to, to someone to, to talk about what AUP members can do about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be talking a little bit more about this later, but of course, the first thing I would say is organize, organize, organize. Um, or, you know, I always like to start by talking to, you know, five people or a few friends and just really talking to them about what's going on and having an honest and comfortable conversation um, to answer each other's questions, to talk about maybe difficult um, topics and to sort of kind of really address those concerns that we all have. But yeah, just to talk to five friends and really try to talk to them about you know, either, you know, what you're facing in the workplace and, and how 
you need help kind of like really holding the government accountable um, or what they might be facing if they're in the private sector and how we can work together uh, to be able to, you know, private and public and all workers together to be able to gather and really push back against the government because really like an injury to one to one worker is an injury to all workers. So when we can come together and uh, collectively do that, we have so much more power. Let's move on to our third big topic. We've talked about how public services are being dismantled. We've talked about how unions uh, are being uh, attacked because really, let's be honest, they're one of the strongest groups in society that can stand up to these kinds of changes. So it makes sense that the government and the UCP would try to come after us as unions and union members. But specifically, the third one, I think, is, is one that worries me the most because it affects the most people. Um, workers are being attacked by this government. If, if you were just to say that to someone in the street, they might be like, whoa, that's kind of, you're overstating things, aren't you? Um, so maybe, maybe let's dive into that a bit. Most workers don't have a union behind them. Um, and so they rely exclusively upon government regulation. Um, to establish the minimum wage, to establish rules around health and safety, um, that, you know, access to workers' compensation, those kinds of things. And what this government has been doing over the last couple of years, and then in the name of cutting red tape, um, they have been weakening those protections for workers. So they've, you know, they've, they've undermined overtime pay. They've set it up in such a way now that if an employer wanted to, they could basically never pay you overtime, um, even if you'd worked you know, hundreds of hours of overtime. Um, they've just sort of taken an ax to a lot of key, we can get talk about the details about occupational health and safety protections, right? Um, they've, they've, you know, gone after farm worker protections. So they've, they've on many different ways, yeah, they've on many different ways that they've kind of undermined core floor protections, you know, things like the minimum wage, they kind of undermine many workers' uh, ability to access uh, even the most basic of things, the minimum wage, right? So they've just, on a, they've had a concerted attempt to try and and chip away, more than chip away, take, take an ax to a lot of um, those protections that have been built up over the last few decades. A good example I'm thinking of when I hear you mention, they lowered the minimum wage for many people from $15 an hour to 13. What have they done to deal with the fact that um, employers will fire that young person when they turn 18, instead of paying them the extra $2 per hour, uh, and they'll hire another lower wage worker instead, right? Um, were those types of changes intentional, do you feel? To be honest, I imagine the, sort of the impacts upon those young workers didn't really even cross their mind because they don't care, right? Like, I think it was more that they were saying, we want to give more flexibility to employers. We want to help them keep their wage costs low, right? And if that means that at 16 and 17, you earn $13 an hour, but then you turn 18 and you're required then to be paid $15 an hour, that means you're kicked out the door for a 16-year-old. It's the free market that probably would be with their response. Yeah, I, I mean, with the first example, I would say that that was actually probably a very intentional decision. There's been lots of advocacy for years about having a higher minimum wage and about how when we have reductions in minimum wage that the folks who are most uh, drastically impacted are often like workers of color, uh, young workers, women, uh, folks who are taking, uh, you know, single, single parents, uh, so that research is out there, and I am sure they had heard of it, because uh, it would have been really hard not to at this point, because it's, it's been a long time where we've been having these discussions about the importance of having a, a solid minimum wage for all workers. But I would also say, you know, they've recently, with Bill 47, proposed changes to WCB, you know, where they're attacking not just, you know, there's they're attacking all workers, but they're also going after workers who are injured or, or ill, uh, and making significant changes around cost of living adjustments, PTSD presumption, uh, removing the uh, Fair Practices Office. They're making really big changes to how people's claims could possibly be paid out. And those are, those are injured and ill workers, and they chose to do that in a pandemic when it is very likely that somebody could possibly get sick because of their, their work. Uh, and that's a really important discussion, I think, for us to be having is, you know, the risks that folks are taking because of the, the pandemic at, at work uh, and how sick people can get, we still don't know the long-term impacts of that. And during this pandemic, this government has chose to directly attack the system that is made to 
help workers who become injured or ill. And, and we know for, you know, a long time, we saw what's happened with things, for example, like Westray and the mine explosions. Like it's been a long time. We know that workers take a lot of risks at work. It is impossible for this government to have ignored all the evidence that uh, workers and scholars and people have been collecting for years and years and years. So I, I see it as very intentional decisions that they're making to try and put more money in the, in the pockets of employers. You know, Jason, you're a specialist in occupational health and safety. It's one of those things that you've really dedicated a lot of your career to. Can you just walk us through some of the Bill 47 um, pieces really briefly? Um, so what they've been doing is they've been particularly going after worker rights uh, under health and safety. And so, for example, joint health and safety committees, which seem kind of boring um, and sort of, you know, again, sort of processy. But they actually are an important linchpin in terms of the workers' right to participate uh, and their right to know what's happening. And when you have an empowered Joint Health and Safety Committee, they can be really quite impactful in a workplace in terms of making it safer. Um, this government under Bill 47 has gutted the Joint Health and Safety System. It's basically now they're just going to be employer-controlled uh, shell, shells uh, of what they were. Um, one that I think matters and I think is going to have very real consequences. They've also weakened uh, workers' right to refuse. Uh, when you can re re legally refuse to work on to do unsafe work has been restricted. And the reason I highlight that is that I think about just earlier this year at the beginning of the pandemic when the Cargill plant in High River had a COVID-19 outbreak. You probably all remember that news because it was fairly big news. Uh, and they eventually had to shut the plant down to try and sort of deal with the outbreak. What the part of the story that people may not know is what finally triggered the employer to deal with the issue is a bunch of the workers in that plant invoked their right to refuse. Um, and they refused to come to work because they said these are unsafe conditions. Uh, it's, a, it's an immediate risk to my, my life and safety and those of my coworkers. And so they refused. Under this new legislation, um, that particular circumstance of refusing would be illegal. So workers won't be, wouldn't be able in a pandemic to be able to take direct action to protect themselves and, their, and others um, under this legislation. That's, that's the kind of gutting that they're doing to, to health and safety protection. And then just very quickly, the other thing they've done is they've implemented this whole new thing where an employer can apply to just not have the health and safety regulations apply to them. Um, they can get permission to just kind of ignore uh, the specifics of what uh, health and safety protections are. So that that's kind of the scope that we're talking about. It seems like they're really going after vulnerable workers, um, immigrants, uh, women, young workers, farm workers, and uh, workers who aren't unionized. Uh, maybe uh, I'm not being clear about that, but why would they do that? Why would they go after the people who work in this workforce that are already so vulnerable and need those things like health and safety protections? they don't care about workers <laughs> they just they really truly don't care about workers right they they are very concerned about being profit driven and driving profits in the province and that is that is their main uh goal i mean we've seen there are a few research studies out there about the how the pandemic has impacted women in particular and we've seen no measures by the government to be able to address that and we know that there are you know, we know there are many folks who work in healthcare who are doing a lot to be able to help people in the pandemic, and this government is not providing, you know, enough protections for them. Or the folks who work in grocery stores who are providing food to all of us during this time, they're not getting the protections that they need. Um, if you go after the most vulnerable workers who are the least, the least in a position to be able to push back and, under, and weaken their situation, undermine their working conditions, that places pressure on the people above them. And then the people above them to drive their working conditions down, right? And so it's it's a process of undercutting the bottom um, in order to have us all fall into the hole. Um, and so it's also an attempt to try and sort of bring to affect all workers. So it's a really perverse kind of approach, right? Let's harm the people who um, are the most vulnerable um, in order to be able to try and attack all of us. You're saying that one way of going after AUP members and other members of unions who have um, well-paid um, jobs, um, some form of RSP or a pension 
and some benefits. One way of reducing their expectations and their um, compensation is to knock out the rung of the ladder one step below them. And there's pressure down on them. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's an excellent metaphor. Um, get rid of that bottom rung and it becomes harder for anybody to climb the ladder. What have you seen happening with regard to pensions and the attack on workers because of pensions? Hmm. Uh, well, we saw with Bill 22, a uh, piece of legis legislation that introduced some governance changes um, and how the boards uh, function. Although I want folks to know that like your pension plans are still very effectively managed um, and by the corporate boards that you folks have representation on as well as on the sponsor boards. Uh, but we have seen, you know, the government talk about things like CPP and pension plans and sort of really going at all facets um, of our social structure. Uh, and again, that is about, you know, I, all, I think a big component of it as well is that when you constantly attack people and you constantly go after, um, you know, their, their pension governance or you go after their wages or um, you make things difficult in healthcare or the education system, it really, for folks who are working in one or two jobs and I used to work multiple jobs and it becomes when you're really tired, they think that you're not gonna fight back anymore because they're like, they're busy, they're working really hard. They're not gonna fight back. We've made things really difficult for them. Um, when in reality, we know like folks are gonna organize and are going to fight back. Uh, but that is one way they try to sort of like weaken workers is by taking things away or making your life harder. They think that we're not gonna fight back when we, we are. I wanna ask this question. Is it fair to say that not doing enough or not doing the right things to prevent the spread of COVID-19 is a kind of an attack on workers in general? Um, I mean, not, not even speaking to sort of the broader public implications of mishandling um, COVID restrictions. If we think about the fact he's saying he's trying to protect these workers, but he's not offering up anybody paid sick pay Right. So, you know, if, if there were if they have a if they start to come up with some symptoms and they have to go and isolate for a few days as they wait for their COVID test, they lose their wages. Um, so what are they going to do? They're going to go to work right? because they have to. So it's it bring the, his his defense of low low wage workers kind of rings hollow. Right? Is, is that there's no there's no real sort of concern there about the real life implications of being out and about, being doing essential work, being a healthcare worker, being a grocery store worker, um, and, and not having anything to fall back on should you get sick. But instead of, you know, really taking accountability, making tough decisions, uh, Jason Kenney is asking people to take on all of that responsibility and still go to work and take care of your kids and, you know, get your, get your degree online and, you know, make sure that everything's okay with your family. Take care of somebody in long-term care. Don't worry about your rescheduled surgery. Maybe it'll happen at some point, right? Like he's really asking our members and everyday Albertans to sort of figure this out for ourselves instead of taking responsibility. Let's take some more questions that might've come into this point. Ferris, any questions? So um, can we rely on the courts to strike down anti-union legislation? Um, and should we wait for the courts? Um, and, and if we are, if we are going to wait, what should we do in the meantime? If we're not going to wait, what should we do? We need to turn to the courts to kind of curtail some of the worst of the, of the UCP agenda. Um, but it's time consuming. It takes a long time to have that happen. It's really literally a case of you're closing the barn door long after the horses have, have, have fled. Um, and so it's important to do that in order to protect the integrity of our rights, um, but it's not enough. Um, and there needs to be things that happen now um, in order to be able to try and stop them and get them to blink, um, to use the phrase that, that Ralph Klein would use, right? Is to get them to, to sort of think twice uh, about acting on some of the things they've given themselves the powers to do. I do agree. I think the courts, they, they play an important role, um, but I always caution against relying on the court system or the the legal system or the justice system as sort of a way to provide social justice because it is a system that's so embedded in power dynamics and it really does exert power over people. So, I mean, for me, what I find really exciting is looking at um, examples like the Chicago Teachers Union. 
they've started um, really integrating some social justice into how they collectively bargain. So they, in their last round in 2019, they uh, bargained around contract length, um, benefits, class sizes, but they also included clauses around community justice. So they really fought for affordable housing for students and teachers, but they also provide a lot of uh, information about um, ICE and how that can impact um, students and workers of color. And they also provide information about legal aid for immigrants. So really like integrating these community justice, social justice uh, aspects into how we bargain uh, is really important. You could do that on issues like working short, you can fight for affordable housing. There's lots of ways for us to be able to negotiate or talk about or, or push back um, what the government is doing by sort of really getting excited about what some other unions have sort of started pushing for. And, and those folks did hit the picket line in 2019 and did end up winning that affordable housing piece. And that is just really important because we know if kids don't have somewhere to live or they don't have something to eat, that makes their education really difficult. But those folks, you know, they don't just need housing to be able to go to school and to get into post-secondary. They also need housing because it's a right and they're humans and, and they are valuable uh, to our communities. And, and that's a big part of what we can do in negotiations as well. Uh, where do you think that we should be looking to to move towards? What are some of the solutions to this problem we have of a government that's attacking workers, services, and unions? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the place to start is you have to you have to push back and say no to the things that they're wanting to do. I mean, that's that you can get that's the natural starting point, but it's not enough, right? Like it's it's like it's not enough to just stop them because they'll just come back at you again, right? And just keep whittling away your position, weakening your position, and weakening your position. So. I think what we need to do is as we, as we launch our, 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 our saying no, we also need to find a way to say yes to something. Um, and that's about saying, coming up with ideas and solutions that help bolster and strengthen public services, make them better and more effective. Because by doing that, we restore uh, Albertans trust in public services and their commitment to public services so that Albertans want to join public sector workers in fighting for good things. And so whether that be comprehensive childcare um, so that, that families can, can more effectively participate in the economy, whether it's about indexing our income support programs so that the most vulnerable among us don't have uh, their, 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 their income eaten away by inflation, whether that be smaller class sizes, right? Uh, whether that be a sort of expansive affordable housing so that we can deal with the issue of, of homelessness and houselessness, right? Um, these are the kinds of ideas that as we're saying no to their destructive agenda, um, we need to build a constructive agenda at the same time. Let's take some final viewer questions. So how, how do we get this information out to the majority of people? So uh, other AUP members and members of the public, um, and how do we get workers in Alberta to go on the offensive? Yeah, I mean, I think at the, at the core of it, it's, it's each one of us has to do our little bit, right? Talk to the people in our corner of the world. Uh, it's a little harder to do these days when our our little worlds are really tiny, <laughs> but um, that's what we need to do. Um, we can't hope that, you know, corporate media, we can't hope that Facebook uh, or Twitter is going to kind of suddenly blow up in our favor um, around this stuff. It's about talking to our neighbors. It's about talking to our friends. It's about talking to our family members. That's how we get this information out. It's how we get um, the, 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 the need to push back. Um, and how do we get Again, how do we get other Alberta workers to start to fight back? Well, again, by showing, you know, to, by connecting with them and talking with them, figuring out where they're at and how their situation is actually the same as our situation. We're in this together. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the phrase for COVID that I actually think um, for workers, it's always been true. We're in this together. We either are going to sink together or we're going to find a way to fight together um, to, 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 to be able to stay afloat and, and potentially, you know, move forward. Just that, right? Like having those conversations. And I, I think it's sort of important to acknowledge that sometimes those conversations are difficult and really hard and they're with our loved ones and our, our friends or people maybe we work with. Um, so just to acknowledge that like that, that is a lot of labor doing, having those conversations. That is a lot of your time. 
Uh, but it's important, right? Um, so to also take some time, you know, for you and your family, but to also have those conversations and to try to, um, sometimes it's difficult to like hold our loved ones accountable or to have those difficult conversations with them about these pieces, but to continue, you know, if you can, to have the, the open, honest sort of dialogue with them. And if you feel comfortable to share, you know, the challenges that you're facing in the workplace because of what the government has done or, um, you know, I always tell people what the discussion I had with my mom about healthcare, and it was the best. Once we were able to sort of like, we got to that point where we talked about, we got through the difficult part. Um, she sort of understood that like, oh yeah, I, I'm really uncomfortable now with what the government has done to the healthcare system here. And I understand that this is, you know, a full, you know, provincial responsibility, but also the decisions that I make um, when I vote federally can impact this. And so, you know, it was a great conversation, but it was difficult. Um, and so it's just important to acknowledge that, but also to be able to still to still do it. Ferris, another question. Uh, is there going to be a tipping point um, for this government to be held accountable for their actions? Um, and what could that tipping point be? Well, I mean, it's impossible to sort of predict what will happen in the future, but I think maybe what I'll do is, is hearken us back to 1995. Right. Um, no one at the time thought that the laundry worker strike would be a tipping point. No one thought in 19, you know, when, when those workers went out, they went out because they were mad and they were concerned about their jobs. Um, no one knew that that would be the beginning of shifting politics and shifting the agenda. Um, and so what that tipping point will be, I don't think we can predict. We can only kind of understand that in hindsight. But I think the lesson it takes for us is that we just have to act, we just have to do something um, and hope that, that the accumulation of all the things that we're doing, one or some or all of them will end up being that thing um, that causes the shift. Um, yeah, I, I would add that it, it is difficult to sort of predict what can happen, but I do think um, what this pandemic has revealed, uh, has revealed a lot of what we already knew, right? The, the system is not functioning as it needs to. It's being drastically underfunded. And, you know, a series of governments have, have not put funding into this healthcare system. But for many folks, this pandemic has really revealed sort of like the really uh, negative and devastating consequences of that. And it's sort of pushed a lot of discussion about like, how how is it that we got here? How is it that we, um, you know, have let things, you know, like in long-term care happen. Why has the government let this devastating um, incident happen in long-term care? Why has this continued to go on for years and years? Uh, and, and what I can say, or what I hope is that I know a lot of scholars are collecting a lot of evidence about what has gone on and how the decisions that governments have made are impacting people. And I do think down the line, there will be ways to sort of um, hold hold those governments accountable for the decisions and the, the massive mistakes that they've made. But this pandemic I, I see as something that has really illustrated, highlighted, revealed to many different people just how uh, the attacks on the system have really had devastating impacts. Um, you know, not having enough teachers to be able to provide online teaching or not having enough, um, you know, paid sick days for those teachers can get people, can make people sick or not having enough healthcare workers is really devastating people's lives at the moment. So I do think that this will be, it's a big time for us to push for transformative change in our system for sure. One thing I wanna point out is that a lot of people are really worried about deficits. Well, I, I, I'll respond by saying that uh, taxation rates on corporations and the wealthier, the lowest they have been in almost hundred years, certainly 60 years. Right. Over the last three or four decades, there's been this concerted effort to lower their tax rates. And it's come at the expense of our tax rates and more importantly, our public services. So, you know, I know it's a slogan, but I think it's true. We pay for this by taxing the rich. Um, if we're really all in this together, um, they need to contribute their fair share. And right now they're not. Uh, there's tons of room to be able to, to tax the ultra wealthy and corporations um, without them fleeing the country in, in, in outrage um, because our taxation levels are lower than most OECD countries. Um, and so we have lots of room to be able to be able to finance these things um, through better distributing 
um, uh, how we all contribute. It was always possible for us to put more money into healthcare. It was always possible for us to put more money into education. Uh, governments have just chosen not to. And so uh, when we go forward and we hear, you know, it is concerning, but sometimes governments use that type of language to scare us, right? They're not using this because they, you know, they think it's a great discussion point. They're using it to scare people and to not acknowledge that when they put budgets forth and when they uh, make cuts, that those are actually choices and priorities that they're engaging in every single day and that the responsibility lies on them to prioritize other things like public sector services and healthcare. One thing that that uh, that I actually didn't know, and I think a lot of other people didn't know, is that deficits don't need to be paid back. Deficits aren't when a, when a government when a federal government, uh, sorry, when a federal government runs a deficit that runs a central bank, that is not money that that is owed that needs to be paid back. That's a monetary policy uh, or a monetary tool that's used to either increase or decrease uh, money in the economy, and so. Um, why I think this matters for workers to know is because when workers are demanding robust, fully funded public services, um, the ruling classes who hold all the money and all the power will come to us and say, that's irresponsible. But when a crisis hits an economic system, whether it be the 2008 financial crisis or this current pandemic related crisis, suddenly the taps turn on. They are running massive, massive deficits. And for every dollar that's going to help workers, many, many dollars are going to the richest and the, and the most powerful in our society, whether it's through subsidies to businesses, um, shareholders are reaping the benefits hand over fist um, with, with uh, securities prices exploding right now. So the reality is um, that, they, that they have always been lying to us um, and that they're going to play whatever shell game they want to, um, to try to keep us poor and them rich. So thanks for that point. Any other viewer questions have come through? Uh, what comes after these conversations? Uh, what's our next steps? Uh, so one thing we already talked about was just um, committing to talking to five of your coworkers this week um, or, or talking to five people you know who are um, not unionized as well as five folks who you know in the workplace who are, are not super involved in the union and just talking to them about uh, different ways that they can get involved or you know maybe what you learned today or the discussions that you had uh, questions that you have and you just kind of want to talk about. Um, but just, yeah, how you can work together and build a little bit more um, of that collaboration within the workplace and to have those conversations would be the first thing I would, I would say. I think I want to take a little bit more of a, a historical uh, look at this um, and look back at history and what taught us about when our workers are the most effective. It's about acting collectively regardless of what uh, others say they should or shouldn't do. The labor movement's big gains throughout the 20th century came out of workers saying enough, we have rights, we're gonna stand up for those rights. And you can tell us whether the strike's legal or not legal, we're gonna do it anyway. Those are the things that were most effective is when workers just said, we're gonna do this because this matters to us. And whether there be an injunction or whether there be sort of some legal framework that may or may not allow it, doesn't matter to them because what matters to them is the determination that they're going to protect their jobs, they're going to protect their loved ones, they're going to protect their communities. And that's kind of what it's got to take at a macro level is workers to say to themselves, this matters so much that I'm just doing this. Um, and I'm not going to be afraid um, because when workers aren't afraid and they band together, that's usually when they get things done. So that's a bit of a macro level sort of looking back at our history, but I think we have a lot to learn um, from our predecessors uh, when they went out on picket lines and when they uh, engaged in boycotts and when they did all of the collective actions that they did um, and often quite effectively. Were they always strikes? Um, am I overstating the importance of strikes to win? You have to fight for every gain. Um, you know, it, and, and so it hasn't always been strikes. I mean, there have been other ways in which workers have made gains, but I think the single most poignant things that we see through history was strikes and other sort of collective action that then leads to the kind of changes that we want, right? We have occupational health and safety legislation today that all started to form in the early 70s where we had this network of protections for workers across all industries. Well, if we look back just a little bit before that, 
to the 1960s, we saw a wave of health and safety related strikes, some legal, some not legal, from workers making decisions that, you know what, this job is literally killing me, right? And that my body is not for sale. Um, and I'm going to stand up and de demand that my employer clean up the mess in this workplace. And they would, and they would win in that workplace. And so maybe more, sometimes they didn't win, but it was just this collective wave that started to grow across the country that then led to legislation that then led to the protections that we have today. Um, so yeah, I don't think you can overestimate uh, the importance of workers sort of taking their working conditions and their lives and their, and their public services into their own hands and doing something. Thanks for that, Ferris. Well, I want to now thank those brave viewers who have stuck through to the very end of this very long webinar. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you found this informative and useful. I'd also like to send a deep thank you to Ferris, of course, and also our guest speakers today. So Lauren, would you like to share any final comments just as a sign off? I really appreciate all the work that our members do. So thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Jason, over to you. I want to express my deep thanks once again. It's a pleasure to collaborate with you again. And so any final remarks, Jason? I take uh, no greater pleasure in the opportunity to be able to talk to workers and talk with workers um, about how we can help, uh, how we can help make their lives better. So I'm just uh, appreciative to have had the, the time to be able to share this with you. Keep at it, be brave. Um, and uh, together, we'll win. <laughs>